I want to sing that verse again. Let me sing this verse. Yes, there were times when I wanted to die, but grace and mercy called me by my name and said, not now. Once my heart was lost, but somehow Jesus I'm found. Your grace and mercy is showered down. Why? Your grace and mercy. Church, if you know it, sing along. You join it. 
So good evening and welcome to Resurrection Beach MCC. We are so glad that you're with us this evening. And um, let me just check something here really quick. Cause you know, I always manage to screw something up. So perfect. Cause you know what? It's technology folks. It's not a matter of if it's going to fail. It's simply when. And when happens a lot, right? So 
Welcome to our service this evening. If you haven't had a chance to gather something that represents for you the body and blood of Christ Jesus, I just want to invite you to do that uh, during our praise and worship time. And Meg is going to lead us in tonight's first opening song of... I Love Your Grace. Yes, I Love Your Grace. And so I just want to encourage you to join with Meg as she leads us in singing, I Love Your Grace. of God, don't we? And so let us just open our service in uh, with our opening prayer, shall we? So holy God, we thank you first of all for the rain that you sent over the last couple of days to wash away some of the dirt and the grime, to get rid of some of the heat while the humidity did seem to increase, but we praise you and give you the glory and the honor for all of that, dear God. And we also thank you for bringing us together as a community of faith this evening so that we can be in worship together with you, Holy God. And so we just pray that this entire service would be pleasing unto you. Amen. And so I think that brings us maybe to our announcement. Ah, yes, my favorite red flashing announcement sign. <laughs> so let's see. Today's the 11th. Yeah. So tomorrow, Chai has a birthday. The 13th, Cassie has a birthday. Oh, the 15th is a busy day. So Stephen and Tom have an anniversary. James has a birthday and Bill and James have an anniversary. They actually met on James's 21st birthday. Yes. 
And let's see, then coming up, Alvin has a birthday. Yes, on Friday. Yay. Yeah, so on three, let's just wish everybody a happy celebration, shall we? One, two, three. Happy, happy celebration. celebration. That covers it all, right? And let's see what's that course. Yes, we're still collecting uh, funds for duffel bags. I will be taking another batch over hopefully this week. If not, it'll be the following week. And then uh, look at what we have. We have spiders and we have placards that say, enter if you dare. And we have art supplies for the masks. And so we have masks to go to the, the youth center. And we have all kinds of accoutrement. We have sequins. I know somebody who would absolutely love this package of sequins. I'm just saying. And we have we have decorations. And as I shared last week, we have some beautiful multicolored feathers. And to go with all of this, there's going to be about six pounds of candy finding its way over there. So thank you all so much for everything that you brought in. I, I think they're going to have a wonderful Halloween time. And so that pretty much takes care of everything there. Oh, our big event coming up on Saturday, October 1st at Irvine Regional Park from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We're going to be having a fall potluck picnic type thing. We have ham, chicken, and vegetarian dishes are uh, being provided already. And then uh, we're asking folks to, uh, if they can, or if they're so inclined, to bring something to pass and to share, you know, um, like for example, if your first name starts with A through F, it would be salads like macaroni, tater salad, coleslaw, green green salad, spinach, etc. Uh, G through M is side dishes, uh, you know, mac and cheese, rice, beans, veggies. And if your first name starts with N through U, dessert, y'all know what those are. And if your first name starts with V through Z. How about some appetizers like deviled eggs, cheese and cracker platters, vegetable trays, pickle trays? Oh, you know, all kinds of things. And so an RSVP would be a really nice touch, you know? So why don't you tickle Louise's phone with a text or a call to 951-233-0512. And so what do we have coming up? Oh, yes. And so then this week, I also got an email from... Uh, Reverend Sean here at the UU Church. And coming up on possibly October 22nd, a Saturday, at somewhere around noon, either at a local park or here, they're planning on doing a multi church get to know you. So the UU Church folks would be here or at the park, wherever we end up going. Uh, the Christian Scientist folks would be there, the Quakers would be there, we'll be there. I'm not sure about the Sunday afternoon church. So what they're doing is they just want to get us all together so we can get to know each other. And maybe there will be some opportunities for joint ministry events or things like that. So it might be October 22nd is what they're leaning towards. Yeah, you, I think you'll be gone, right? Not sure. Yet. Probably. But the date is not etched in stone, nor is the location. So I don't know. But so that is coming. And of course, yes, we're still collecting funds so that we can cut $3,300 out of our expenses. And for an, a one-time investment of $1,000, we can do that. Uh, we, we didn't get uh, any extra funds uh, last week. So we're still kind of stuck at the red light at Seagerstrom and Harbor. <laughs> we would like to move. You know, the cops might show up pretty soon and give us a ticket for loitering. I don't know. Um, so that's kind of where we're stuck right there. And uh, we hope to move on so that we can be moved and saving money before the new year starts. Yeah, and there's there's our little van stuck at Seagerstrom and Harbor. So uh, maybe we'll be lucky and we'll get something this week. So that's where we are. And what is next? Our offering. Who would like to do the offering? Anybody? Oh, bless you, dear. Here's the tie-dye pin. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, the 
time has come to open our pocketbooks and to contribute to help keep our church going. So we have a tie-dyed pig here that takes coins as well as greenery. And the tie-dyed pig funds are used to, for outreach ministries, um, such as things like donating things to this uh, home for uh, kids uh, who, are, who don't have homes to go to themselves and uh, various other ministries. And so if you have something that you would like to put in the tie-dyed pig, uh, please feel free to do so. I'm going to put the piggy over here so people can come and put stuff into the tie-dyed pig. I don't know if it's a he or a she, but that's okay. Uh, also, we have our basket here. So for those of you who are attending today and would like to put something in the basket, uh, as we said, you know, we have uh, needs of the church here. And so uh, we'll pass this basket around, but you can also zell uh yes, your funds yes. uh, i don't know what the number is there oh this is what we've got so far uh -huh. for this month so we've got 865 dollars of the 4500 that we need so we could use a few more funds and as i said you can zell your donation in uh to area code 714-662-6972 or if you're like me and you still write checks i guess i'm kind of a dinosaur in that respect uh, but you can send your check to Resurrection Back Beach, MCC 11037, Warner Avenue, number 130, Fountain Valley, California. So please be sure to do Amen. that. And that's going to help us to stay here and to minister to your needs and to the needs of others. Amen. Thank you Amen. so much, Meg. And so then Meg is going to hand that off, and then she'll be leading us in our praise and worship for tonight. And I love the the... Uh, the, the temperament and the, the feeling of the songs that you have picked out for tonight, they are absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you. Well, I was trying to go with the theme that uh, Pastor Dale's message is going to be on. And he said, you know, no matter how terrible we can be at times, that God is faithful mm -hmm. and gracious and merciful. Absolutely. So I tried to pick, up, pick out some songs that uh, kind of reflect that. So we're going to start out with God so loved.
there was another oh, part of know. that and I didn't have it up here. So yeah, that's anyway, fine. <laughs> that was the end. <laughs> it's all, all right. good. <laughs> so this next song we're gonna do is called Graves into Gardens. And you know, like Pastor Dale is gonna preach a little bit later, you know, sometimes we're not so great. You know, but if we come to God and ask him for his forgiveness, he is righteous and just to forgive us of our sins. So that's kind of what this song is about. <clears throat> about you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord and so i think that's just a beautiful part of this song so when we get to it just sing it out <laughs> Your love 
about that God's breath and that's that uh, you know in my Bible commentary because I have this study Bible thing I was talking about God's breath and it said that the Greek word for breath is the same word that they use for spirit and so as Pastor Dale oftentimes says you know when he's doing communion and he says that God breathed into Adam um, with the very same breath that he breathed over the wine and the, and the bread. And uh, it's God's breath that gave Adam life. You know, it brought his spirit to life. And that same breath is in our lungs, God's breath. And the mm -hmm. oxygen that we breathe in the air was created by God. Amen. 
And so it's only right that we should give that breath back to God in our praise. And that's what this song is about. <laughs>
Ray yeah. Mario. Uh, Ray. Not Ray Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could. Well, we yeah. do have a video for the service, so maybe we'll do some more music. Yeah, let's sing one more night. <laughs> well, we will do that again. We'll have a mu full music service some night again because those are always nice. So that does bring us to the time in our service for our scriptures. And so I will read the first scripture tonight, and then Chris will be reading the other one. And so our first scripture for this evening comes to us from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17 from the message translation. And this is Paul speaking. I'm so grateful to Christ Jesus for making me adequate to this work. You know, he went out on a limb, you know, entrusting me with this ministry. The only credentials that I brought to it were violence, witch hunts, and arrogance. But I was treated mercifully because I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't know who I was doing it to. Grace mixed with faith and love, poured over me and into me, and all because of Jesus. Now, here's a word that you can take to heart and depend on. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I'm proof of that. Public sinner number one, that's me, of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. And now, he shows me off, evidence of his endless patience to those who are right on the edge of trusting him forever. Deep honor and bright glory to the king of all time. One God, immortal, invisible, ever and always. Oh, yes. This is uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10 in the Passion Translation. Many dishonest tax collectors and other notorious sinners often gathered around to listen as Jesus taught the people. This raised concerns among the Jewish religious leaders and experts of the law. Indignant, they grumbled and complained, saying, look at how this man associates with all these notorious sinners and welcomes them all to him. In response, Jesus gave them this illustration. There once was a shepherd with a hundred lambs, but one of his lambs wandered away and was lost. So the shepherd left the 99 lambs out, out in the open field and searched in the wilderness for the one lost lamb. He didn't stop until he found it. With exuberant joy, he raised it up, placed it on his shoulders, and carried it back with cheerful delight. Returning home, he called all his friends and neighbors together and said, let's have a party. Come and celebrate with me the return of my lost lamb. It wandered away, but I found it and brought it home. Jesus continued, in the same way, there will be a glorious celebration in heaven over the rescue of one lost sinner who repents, comes back home and returns to the fold, more so than for all the righteous people who never strayed away. Jesus gave them another parable. There once was a woman who had 10 valuable silver coins. When she lost one of them, she swept her entire house diligently, searching every nook and cranny for the one coin lost. When she finally found it, she gathered all her friends and neighbors for a celebration, telling them, come and celebrate with me. I have lost my precious silver coin, but now I have found it. That's the way God responds. Every time one lost sinner repents and turns to him, he says to all his angels, let's have a joyous celebration for the one who was lost, I have found. Amen. 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 So, 
you know, as I was uh, preparing for today's message, what kept going through my mind was that today is the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And in the liturgical calendar, of course, the scriptures for this week do carry the message of God's grace and mercy. And so I really didn't know how those two things would combine together. And I still don't. So we will take it as it comes and pray that God will work his magic or her magic and will make it all make sense. So, you know, so when I look at Paul, and of course he admits his credentials for being who God turned him into being was violence, witch hunts, and arrogance. Three things he did very well at. And only because of God's grace and mercy and his willingness to repent of his old ways was he then able to become the shining example, first of all, of God's patience because God had to be extremely patient with him to get him to that point, didn't he? And then God uses him as a shining example of God's grace and mercy, because here's someone at the opposite end of the spectrum from God's desires and beliefs. And he was able to convert him and bring him into the fold. So Saul, as Saul before he became Paul, is probably the best known example of the lost sheep. And he was so far lost that you couldn't have found him with a telescope. But yet God knew exactly where he was. Just like God knows exactly where we are at any given moment, doesn't he? And, you know, um, I love the part where uh, Paul speaks of uh, being an example for those teetering on the edge of trusting in God forever. I assume he's speaking about the Gentiles because on the one hand, they could still be worshiping the gods that they had always worshiped, or they could be worshiping the one true God. And so they're kind of teetering on the edge. And we've all kind of teetered on the edge at some point or other, haven't we, if we're being truly honest with ourselves? Because none of us were born, well, we were all born pure, but we didn't become pure pretty quickly. But we just, um, and that thought just disappeared. So it must not have been important, and that's perfectly fine, right? And, you know, and in our uh, Luke passage where it talks, of course, about the, uh, the lost sheep, but it talks about the lost coin. You know, how many times do we spend hours and hours looking for something that's lost? You know, somebody might carry their, their glasses right here so that they always know where they are, right? Or uh, maybe you're like Fernando and you're always losing your uh, earbuds. You can never find them. And I'm always like, well, where did you have them last? Well, I don't know. And days later, they turn up, right? Or recently, I discovered I, I had two electric razors, right? I had one that I had purchased and one that was my father's. And when he passed away, my mother made sure that I took it back with me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so do you think I can find mine? I still have dad's. But I'll be darned if I can find the one that was mine. It was a really pretty blue, too. <laughs> My favorite color. But I've spent hours looking for that thing. I have tore the pantry and the bathroom apart looking for it, and I cannot find it. So these are just things, things that can be replaced. But God always knows exactly where everything is, where each and every one of his children are. And he calls upon us, I know we're not Paul's, now are we? We didn't persecute, well, hopefully not. <laughs> um, but we're not Paul's, but yet God calls us to be the exact same example, doesn't he, of God's grace and mercy. And you know, the slide, as it says, at our very worst, aka Paul, or Saul, I should say, or our very lowest. And how many times have we found ourselves at the very lowest? Perhaps 
uh, a relationship has ended or a spouse has passed on or uh, we've lost a job or this or that or the other thing or the really big events in a nation's history, uh, the passing of a monarch after 70 years. Pearl Harbor, which we remember the destruction and the death that took place. World War I, World War II, the Holocaust. We weren't around during the Christian Crusades, but I know there was a lot of death and destruction there. And then there's 9-11. Thousands of people died that day when the two towers were destroyed, when the Pentagon was attacked with that one plane. And the heroes that were on United Airlines Flight 93, who chose to give up their lives to crash that plane so that it would not make it to what they believed was gonna be the White House. So these people, they gave of themselves. And so when they are at their lowest, when their families were at their lowest grieving, is when God's grace and mercy came flowing into them if they received it, if they wanted it. And you know, I have to thank you, Meg, for the sending me the link to that video. I had never seen that before. I did not even know that it existed. And so it is a video uh, about 9-11, but it comes to us from the angle of some of the rescuers, the ones that you would never expect to have been involved in. And it's a very touching tribute. It's about 12 minutes long. And so we're going to go ahead and bring that up now if we can. And so we're just going to, for our folks who are joining us at home so that you can get the full effect of the video, we're going to be uh, stopping our video camera and muting the microphone of the, the audio, and then we'll be showing this. And so I just want to encourage each of us that, and yes, it's very touching and it's a very powerful video, but it also shows us and reminds us that even in the most terrible moments that we still have God's grace and mercy. And let me move out of the way. It should start, maybe. Yeah, there it comes. Can you turn it up? I thought I was watching a movie, Towering Inferno at first. And then I looked real close, and I noticed it was the World Trade Center. I was compelled because I'm a type of person that can't stand by and watch other people suffer. And to me, they were suffering. They wanted to get off the island. And there was no way for them to get off the island other than the water. And I had noticed when I was watching the television, I saw a lot of, you know, the going up and slips, taking people on I said, fine, we could do the same thing. I could take people on my boat, get in there, take them where they have to go. And that's what we did. On the morning of September 11th, when the towers came down, millions of people ran for safety. Hundreds of thousands of them ran south to the water's edge. That's when they realized that Manhattan is indeed an island and that they were trapped. They were feeling helpless. And that's the worst feeling in the world. What was a person on the ground gonna do? Buildings were down. There were people laying under the rubble of the building. Firemen, civilians. My wife was there, and I turned around. I says, I've got to go do something. Just like that. And she looked at me. She says, what are you going to do, you maniac? I says, I'm going to take the Amberjack up into the city and help. She says, but what if they're attacked again? I says, well, then that's something I have to live with. I says, I have to do what I have to do. I says, and nobody can stop me right now. E even if I save one person or I rescue one person, that's one person less that will suffer and die. 
They were trying to evacuate Manhattan because nobody knew what was going on. You know, you didn't know something else was going to happen. It was just, uh, you know, a madness on one side and, you know, and wanting to help people on the other side. They were just streaming out of the buildings. And the first mode of transportation they saw was a, a ferry boat. That's when they knew, this is how I'm getting out of here. So they didn't even care where the boat was going. There wasn't panic in New York in the beginning just volume. So it wasn't until the first building fell that there was panic. You heard the building go down, but we're in the slip, so we can't see it. That's when we started letting go, and then all of a sudden, boom, engulfed. You couldn't see anything. People were actually jumping into the river and swimming out of Manhattan. Boats were very nearly running them over. Wait, 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 wait. These people wanted out of Manhattan no matter any way they could. Somebody wants you to go over there. Every mode of transportation out of Manhattan was shut down. All the subways were shut. The tunnels were all closed. They closed the bridges. They closed everything immediately. Boats, usually an afterthought in most New Yorkers' minds, were for the first time in over a century the only way in or out of Lower Manhattan. The process that actually had already started, there were some boats that were grabbing people, that people were lined up at the walls. On the left, on the left, on the left. It's just human nature. You see people in distress on the seawall in Manhattan begging you to pick them up. You have to, you have to pick them up. They didn't know what was going on. They seen the building getting hit with these two planes. As far as they was concerned, you know, we were being bombed. I was wondering if they were going to come on the boat, if, if they were, had people with bombs or if they were going to come on. We're a big orange target in the middle of that harbor. My job is to keep the boat safe, my passengers safe, my crew safe. Everybody was in shock, running around. They didn't want to leave the family. They had loved ones running around the city. There was a small boat that was uh, at the lower tip of Manhattan. I thought the boat was going to flip over because so many people were trying to get on. And as I looked behind, they were, they were just 10 deep. And that's kind of what gave us the idea. We decided that this has to get better organized, and we better do it. And that's what we did. So we decided to make the call on the radio. All available boats. This is the United States Coast Guard board, the pilot boat in New York. Anyone want to help with the evacuation of Lower Manhattan? Report to Governor's Island. When that call came on the radio, they were coming. I was uncertain of who was going to respond. About 15, 20 minutes later, there are just boats all across the horizon. Literally 100 targets converging on the lower part of Manhattan. When we came out of that dust cloud, tugboats, I'd never seen so many tugboats all at once. There was just a, like a fleet of tugboats headed to Manhattan. If it floated and it could get there, it got there. All different size, shapes, and form. I mean, and they were zooming across this water. Ferries, private boats, party boats. I worked on the water for 28 years. I've never seen that many boats come together one time that fast. One radio call, and it just came together just that fast. Hundreds of boats converged on the city leaving the sun-bathed harbor behind them. Dead ahead, the unknown. That was something I won't forget. It was just low, dark, acrid, black smoke. It's like there was a big chimney in Manhattan. When we pulled into Pier 11, the dust was unbelievable. 
And then out of nowhere, you just kept on seeing people coming. They looked like zombies coming through the fog, and you knew that they were, those were human beings. Don't leave us. Please don't leave us here. Take us. Do you need help? Do you need help? At that point, the Coast Guard said, not how many people are you allowed, how many people can you fit? Come on, guys. Anybody coming? Get your ass over here now. Now. Come on. The boats started hanging. Literally would take a bed sheet off a bunk and, and a can of spray paint and paint their destination on. Some of these people never been in the water, never been on a boat before. Housewives, workers that do windows. We had executives. And the thing that was the best, everyone helped everyone. I saw four businessmen lifting up an old woman with a seeing eye dog, the German Shepherd, and they lifted her up like a surfboard and passed her over the handrails. When we would carry a load of people over, and there was somebody standing there that seen her husband or wife, you know, that made us feel even better, you know? Well, at least we got two back together, you know? So keep on going, you know? The guy that works at the ferry, he's a, a welder. His son was on my boat. He, he actually came up. And, uh, He thanked me. We went back and forth all day long, carrying boat loads, as many as our, our boat would hold. And it was a lot of people. A lot of people. You couldn't have planned nothing to happen that fast that quick. No training. This was just people doing what they had to do that day. You forget all about what you're supposed to do, what the teachers do, and you say, you know what, morally, this is the right way to go, and deep down, this is what I'm going to do. Average people, they stepped up, and uh, when they needed to, they showed me, you know, when the American people need to come together and pull together, they will do it. I do feel a way honored that I was a part of it. It was the greatest thing I ever did with my life. The greatest day that I've ever seen in all my boating, I mean, my life on the water. The Great Boat Lift of 9-11 became the largest sea evacuation in history. Larger than the evacuation of Dunkirk in World War II, where 339,000 British and French soldiers were rescued over the course of nine days. On 9-11, nearly 500,000 civilians were rescued from Manhattan by boat. It took less than nine hours. I believe somebody has a little hero in them. You gotta look in. And it's in there. It'll come out. It need to be. I have one theory in life. I never want to say the word I should have. If I do it and I fail, I tried. If I do it and I succeed, better for me. And I tell my children the same thing. Never go through life saying you should have. If you want to do something, you do it. Oh, well, 
on our vow. I was born, but now I see. the power and the energy and she said yes that's when i felt god's grace and god's grace should be something that we celebrate right even in the midst of those moments of destruction and death but to be able to hold on to and to celebrate god's grace and mercy and so that does bring us to the time in our service for our uh, family prayer. No.
Wow. Why? Why? Didn't they say something about this at the time? I don't know when that video was recorded, so I have no idea when it was done. Because I, I'm sure that all of us watched all of the newscasts and everything that was said. Wonderful. Praise God for those people and the uh, willingness to just step out and help. And put their lives in danger. Yes. To do so. Yes. And not knowing what was going to happen. Wow. Okay. Continued prayers for uh, our COVID sufferers, mm -hmm. Tracy and Pavel. Uh, Cassie's parents, James and Nancy, and praises that Matt and Cynthia have both recovered mm -hmm. and are testing out negative. Right. So we have a little balance there. And we have praises that Candy is home and doing well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Teresa Varilla's friend, Libby, uh, had a... Uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, she had a stent put in. She had a stent put in, and that was very successful. So praise is there. And Diana Spidell's father had some kind of vascular surgery, which was also successful. So we I think our praises this week are outnumbering our prayer requests. Absolutely. Yes. Which is wonderful. And we need to have continued prayers for the firefighters and all of the people who are fighting the wildfires. We just need to pray that they're put out fast. We need this rain to rain on those fires and get them out. And also we need to keep the people of the United Kingdom in our prayers. Their way of life has changed because Absolutely. the monarch that they loved, I think the world loved her has passed. And so that brings a lot of uncertainty. So we just need to keep that country and its people and the extended families of that country in our prayers. Does anyone have a prayer request tonight? Yes. Um, one of our campers, Michael, uh -huh. is in the hospital. Can you get my prayers? Okay. And for Wayne as well, he's still recovering from his surgery. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask for some prayers for Yoni. She was going to come tonight and sing with me, but she started feeling sick at the last minute, so mm -hmm. she wasn't able to make it. Mm -hmm. um, she does plan to start coming back uh, periodically to church. So Wonderful. That would be Good. nice. That and, would be really nice. And yeah. also um, prayers for Pastor Heather, who's still under the weather um, with the virus that she picked up in Colorado. She's back home now, but she's still having to kind of isolate herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so prayers for her recovery, her rapid recovery. Anyone else? Silent requests? Okay. Let's go to God. Loving God, we come before you tonight and we say thank you for our whole list of praises. We are so thankful that prayer works. And we are asking that you would continue to be with us and continue to answer our prayers. And so we lift up Michael and Wayne and Pastor Heather and all of the people that we, uh, we talked about during our time of prayer, because we know that you can heal and encourage and touch all of those people. And Lord, I ask that you would touch the people who raised their hand with a silent request that is so dear to them that they can't even voice it. They just need your help. I lift them up. I know that with your touch, your love, and your grace, whatever it is, can be conquered. And Lord, I just ask that you would 
put out these wildfires, drench them with your cleansing rain and give those firefighters a break and be with the, the, the country of the United Kingdom and all of its people as they mourn and as they look to the future with uncertainty. I ask all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. And so, you know, wildfires are not just here in the U.S. Actually, in the, in the U.K., out in the farm country, they have such a drought that they have had tens of thousands of acres of crops destroyed by fire. And so, you know, wheat, oats, barley, all of those things are gone. And so we just need to be in prayer for rain everywhere, a nice drenching rain. And so as we begin to prepare our hearts for communion, Meg is going to come and lead us in singing. Oh, remember me. Oh, yes, I love that one. Pastor Barbara's favorite. Yes. <laughs> for communion. service when we are invited to come to Christ's table. This is not Resurrection Beach MCC's table. It is not any church's table. It's Christ's table. And at every service, we remember the events that took place in the upper room that night. When Jesus was gathered there with his disciples, the people that he had been in ministry with, and his family of choice. And we are pretty sure that there was more than just men there. Because as someone had shared with me, even back then, if there had been a band of 12 or 13 men 
wandering through the countryside, they would have been looked upon as probably some kind of a gang. So there would have been women and children and pets and families with them at all times. And I'm sure that they were in the upper room that night as well. And so after um, Jesus returned from washing the feet of those gathered in an act of servanthood, he reached into the center of the table and he picked up a piece of bread. He raised it toward heaven. He blessed it. He gave thanks for it. He broke it. And then he said to those gathered, this bread represents my body, which will be broken for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you eat of this bread, remember me. And likewise, when they had consumed that after he passed it to them, he reached into the center of the table and he picked up a cup of wine. We believe it to be the cup of Elijah that was put out in anticipation of the coming Messiah. He raised it toward heaven. He blessed it. He gave thanks for it. And yes, indeed, he did breathe into it in the very same breath that God had breathed into Adam, that spirit, that living spirit. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant that I make with you today. Whenever you consume of this cup, remember that covenant, embrace it, and live it. And he passed it among them, and they consumed it. So let us pray over the elements, and then I will distribute. Holy and loving God, we thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for these elements that can represent for us this evening the body and the blood of Christ Jesus, your son and our savior. And so we just pray, dear God, that you would indeed consecrate these elements and make them for us representative of Christ Jesus. And that in our consuming these, that we would be filled yet again to overflowing, just as you overflowed Paul with your grace and mercy, that we too would be overflowing with grace and mercy, and that we would be a living example of that to all that you put in our lives. In these things we pray. Amen. And so I am going to... Would you like to pass this? Thank you. And so we're going to uh, distribute the, the elements and then we will all receive communion together. Let us now receive the body of Christ Jesus. Let us receive the cup. Holy God. We thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this table. And we just pray in your holy name that we would always be the example of your grace and mercy to others. These things we pray. Amen. So that brings us to our closing song, which is a beautiful song, and it's called The Blessing.
surrounded and we are filled with God's grace and mercy. And so that has brought us to a short, quick announcement. And I think uh, just to remind you about the picnic coming up on October 1st, uh, please uh, RNSVP to Louise tickle her phone, 951-233-0512 with either a text or a phone call. And so that we know how many folks are coming so that we can kind of prepare and plan for how much of what the church is going to provide we will have. And what else do we have? Oh, that's it. Wow. Short announcements at the end. huh? Well, I mean, you know, you don't need to announce everything, right? So it has been a pleasure to be in worship with you all this evening. And to our folks who are joining us from that patio wearing those fuzzy bunny slippers and having some beverage of some kind. Thank you so much. And now we will bid you a fond adieu after we do a short blessing over the food and anointing 
of those who are going to be working for that food. So Holy God, we just thank you so much. And we pray for your anointing touch on each person who's going to have anything to do with the food that we are going to receive this week. The farm workers, processing plant workers, store workers, restaurant workers, the home cook, and everybody in between. We just pray that you would keep each one of them safe, allow them to return home to their families at the end of each day, healthy and safe with no hurts. And we pray especially, Holy God, for the food itself that we're going to receive, that it would be nourishing to our bodies so that we can go and be all that you have called us to be, disciples of Christ. Amen. And so now we're going to get to bid you all a fond adieu until next week as we blow you all a kiss. Mwah.